All right. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the delay. We were having some technical issues, but we are here for another episode of Positively Connected with Dogs. And today I have a very special guest with us who's going to talk to us about something that I actually don't know anything about. So I'm super excited to learn along with all of you today. Kayla Fratt, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for being patient with all the technical issues. <laughs> Absolutely. It happens. It happens. It happens. So today we're going to talk about something that, again, I don't know anything about, so I'm super excited. And that topic is canine conservation work. So talk to us a little bit about what that is. Yeah. So canine conservation work or um, conservation detection dogs, which is kind of, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to say it, but um, conservation detection dogs are basically dogs that are, they're search dogs, they're detection dogs. So think kind of along the lines of search and rescue dogs, bomb dogs, narcotics, canines, those sorts of things. But instead of looking for missing people or bombs or drugs, what the dogs are looking for are things that are related to conservation biology. Okay. Um, so that tends to fall into kind of three main groups. Um, there's a lot of groups of three in, in my initial spiel. Um, <clears throat> And so those can be ecological monitoring. So that might be something like having the dog sniff out scat of an endangered species so that biologists can know how many of that species are in a park or, you know, who the breeding pairs are or what they're eating or, you know, you can find out all sorts of great things from scat. Um, two would be invasive species work. So that might be screening vehicles or boats before they get permission to launch um, to make sure that they're not carrying an invasive species with them or potentially working with um, mitigation crews. So you might have a group of volunteers who go out to pull an invasive weed off of a hillside, and then the dogs will often go out after the people um, to see if they've missed anything. And then the third broad group within conservation detection dog work is wildlife crime. Um, and I'm a little bit less familiar with that just because I live in the interior of the US and poaching and animal trafficking isn't as much of an issue if you're not talking about big international borders, um, broadly speaking. So those um, those canine organizations are often stationed in ports of entry. Um, so think like Port of Seattle, um, airports, or there are quite a few in like big parks in um, Africa, Southeast Asia, places like that. And there the dogs are actually screening for contraband like pangolins or snow leopard skins or whatever Very else cool. it could be. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So this is kind of something pretty unique. I've never met anyone else that does this before. How did you get started in this? I have a background in ecology. I basically grew up wanting to be Jane Goodall. I wanted to go out and live in the jungle and stare at animals all day. <laughs> um, and that was, that was really the dream. Um, and then through throughout college, I started realizing that A, those jobs are a lot less common now. Ecology now is much more based on uh, just a lot of data modeling and um, a lot more computer work. And especially the, the decently paying jobs don't tend to be the ones that are in the field um, because that's the fun stuff. So you can send volunteers and interns out to do that. Um, and you can't pay a mortgage off of being a volunteer or an intern. Um, and, at the same time, I kind of fell into dog training accidentally as a way to pay rent in college. So I um, I lost my work study and ended up getting a job as a dog walker. I just like literally put a, an ad up on Craigslist and was like, oh, walk your dogs um, and started doing that and just kind of fell in love with dog training and like the behavior and the relationship. And I was totally, I didn't know what I was doing at all. I was, um, but I really loved it. And um loved it enough that I started finding myself some mentors, really getting into the field of dog training. And the whole time people would kind of be like, Kayla, you really love dog training and you're really good at this. Why don't you do that instead of ecology? And I'd be like, no, no, that's not like a real job or, you know, like what am I going to college for and getting this fancy pantsy degree in ecology for if I'm going to just train people's dogs? Um, and I was really yeah. poo-pooing at a long time. Um, Fast forward to after, after I graduated college, I actually did go ahead and get a job at an animal shelter and was really involved in training and behavior and just kind of came around to the idea that I actually did really love it and I wasn't, I wasn't above it, despite what I thought <laughs> when I was in college. And um, around that time, I heard about the field of conservation detection dogs. And basically, as soon as I heard about the field, I was like, that's what I'm going to do with my life. That's what I want to do. That 
lets me have like this amazing one-on-one relationship with the dog and do the training, but I'm also out in the field and I'm also getting to like do stuff for ecology and conservation biology. Um, And it took quite a while from there to actually break into the field. As you said, it's a really small field. Um, There's just really not many groups doing this. Um, And there's not, you know, it's hard to break into something like search and rescue even, but most areas you can find a volunteer search and rescue group. And if you've got free time on the weekends and you're willing to to work your way and you can probably figure it out, that's not true for conservation dog work. Um, And basically what happened is I was really annoying um, and persistent with the organizations that I knew about. and got a lucky break in that I basically decided that I was gonna go to grad school to study the selection and training of conservation dogs. Um, I was like, okay, that's how I'm gonna get into this field. It's all just get enough degrees that they can't ignore me anymore. Um, And in the process of writing my grant applications to go to grad school, I made a bunch of really good connections and ultimately was offered a job and didn't end up going to grad school. So, um, and then I was, yeah, sorry. And then I was with them for about 18 months um, before um, we've parted ways now uh, as of November of 2020. So it's been a couple months and now I'm kind of out on my own. I feel like I, I know enough to, I've got my feet under me and I'm really excited kind of for the next steps and getting to do it on my own. I've been a serial entrepreneur for most of my life. So it works. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about what you personally do. So you know, you mentioned that you're not doing a lot of the game or animal crime uh, mm-hmm. work b- due to location, but what are, I know you've got um, a border collie that, that works out with you. Mm-hmm. So what kind of things are you guys doing personally together? Yeah, so I have two border collies right now. Um, one is a seven-year-old working dog. He's been working for about two years. Um, and then the other is a five-month-old puppy who's hopefully going to be starting to work maybe by the end of this summer. He's looking really, really good. Um, which is exciting. I was thinking he might not be able to be useful until he was two, but I think I'm wrong. Um, And so, so far, our plan for this summer is we're actually going to be doing bat carcass detection surveys out on the wind farm somewhere in the Midwest. We're still kind of working out the logistics of exactly where we're going to be. Um, So the, you know, the point of that is these big wind farms are doing um, ecological or environmental impact studies of seeing how many bats are the windmills actually killing? Um, so it's the cool thing is, uh, as many of our listeners may know, um, it's really easy to get your dog to find dead things. Uh, dogs are really, really good at that. Um, so the tricky thing for me is I've got like a freezer full of like dead mice and bits of dead rabbits and dead bats. And then I'm just basically training my dog that like, no, no, we don't really care about the dead mice. Just find the dead bats. Um, <laughs> So it's there's a lot of like putting on gloves and handling dead stuff and poop in this field. Um, so th- that you is, you know, thick skin. yeah, 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 yeah. You can't be super squeamish in this field. Um, so that's what we're doing for this summer. That'll probably pretty much eat up our entire field season this year. And then next year, we're looking at a couple really cool projects um, with uh, a couple different types of endangered turtle down in the southeastern United States and ha- actually having the dog try to find these turtle nests um, that are kind of like buried in these tufts of grass in a bog um, or a marsh or a swamp. I'm not sure which. Um, so we'll be we'll be getting to help with those sorts of projects as well in 2022. That's super cool. So I imagine that moving from project to project, there's different prep work that you have to do with your dogs because as you said, finding, you know, dead rat is very different than finding turtle nests. So do you yep. have to know what the job is going to be a little bit in advance in order to prepare the dog for it? Yeah, ideally when I'm talking to a prospective client, we do a lot of kind of talking about what are some other similar scents that might in the, be in the area that we have to worry about? So, you know, with the example of the bats, like we know that there could also just be dead mice on the ground or <clears throat> dead birds that were also hit by the windmill, but we don't care about them. So making sure that I, I'm aware of the other potential distractors that my dog has to be comfortable with working around. And then also thinking about what the implications are if my dog does um, collect the wrong item. And in some cases, the scientists are actually cool with that um i this particular windmill project they want just bats but some of them they're like oh no we want to hear about if there's a dead bird we want to know that too um so kind of talking about what their goals are um 
is really important. And then thinking through, you know, the target, um, both with animals and plants. One of the things we've found is that with plants, sometimes at certain types, times of the year, the plant is a lot less stinky. Um, and there's a lot less scent available to the dog, so we can look into things like that. A lot of times that just seems to come with experience because the scientists don't necessarily know that before they've actually worked with a dog team. Um, potential risks in an area, um, the organization I used to work with um, has done a couple Gila monster uh, surveys in the past, and there you have to really think carefully about the time of year where the Gila monsters are hibernating so that the dog approaching a Gila monster is not going to result in the dog being bitten by the Gila monster. Um, I got a bunch of emails back with the big murder hornet scare this time last year of people being like, can you teach your dog to find the murder hornet nests? And me kind of being like, no, I'm not going to send my dog to murder hornet No. Yeah, that, that's a great job for like a drone. Like one day when we make a a drone that can do this work, I, but I'm not sending my dog in there. Um, I think I've lost track of the question, but hopefully that answered it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was great. When you when you're going out on these projects, mm -hmm. is it generally just you and your dog? Or are you going out with other dog and handler teams? Are there scientists with you? What does that kind of daily work look like? It varies a ton. Um, so yeah, generally in the field, it'll just be one dog at a time in a given area. Sometimes you might be, if you were say canvassing, uh, 10,000 acre park, you might have three different dog handler teams out at the same time, but they're not working next to each other necessarily. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we will have, um, what we call an orienteer with us as well. So we've got someone else whose job it is to look at the GPS and keep us on track so that I can just focus on the dog. And that comes to be really uh, important if we're going over really rugged or remote terrain um, and needing to like walk in a lot of straight lines and stuff because then it's just way easier to have someone else who can help me do that because I've already got my mind on 15 different things as I'm going through the field. And then, yeah, sometimes we will also have other scientist partners. They might not be out with us in the field at the time, but, you know, if, if my dog makes an alert, so he, he lies down and says, hey, I've got something here, I'll mark it on my GPS. And then it, usually at the end of the day, I'm sending that over to the scientist teams and they may be coming out then to remove a weed and kill it, or they might be coming out to set up a camera trap to see if, you know, if the dog thinks that this area is a den, we're going to set up a camera trap and see if we can get pictures. Um, there's all sorts of different kind of next steps. Um, and again, those are things that I'm always talking to my partners about as far as, you know, do you want me to be the one who's collecting and handling the scat for the DNA? Or do you want me to just mark it? Um, if I need to be handling it, how technical is that? How much training do I need? Those sorts of things. And I imagine too, I mean, this is exhausting on you and the dog. I imagine that the dog needs quite a bit of endurance, not only physically to be able to um, navigate the different terrain all day, but also that work ethic to be able to work all day long. So talk to us a little bit about what you do um, to prepare the dog for that and what you do when you're out there searching to kind of keep them motivated. Yeah. So it's a lot of it comes down to selection of the right dog to start out with. Um, while every dog on the planet can sniff out food or dead things for a reward, and that's a great game that pretty much every dog on the planet is going to enjoy, a lot of dogs don't have the stamina for this. Um, and what we tend to do in this field and with most detection dog fields is you look for dogs that are over the top obsessed with toys. Um, so I have a dog, Barley, my Border Collie, pretty much literally stops breathing if you hold a tennis ball out in front of him. His pupils are like the size of dinner plates and he's like quivering. Um, and the reason we want that is because basically I'm asking him to work for up to four hours at a time, potentially without finding anything in areas as distracting as a literal prairie dog um, town. So he has to want his ball so badly that he is able to ignore squirrels and poop and other dogs and birds and you know whatever it is because he wants the ball that badly. Um, and we layer that in. So it's a combination of a lot of what we call classical conditioning of just teaching them like odor, toy, odor, toy. Like this is the best thing. And you start seeing like this, you know, this unconscious response from the dog where 
he um, sometimes he'll be running and he'll run past a target that I've placed out or kind of run into where the scent is. And he'll stop so fast that his back legs lift up off the ground because like his brain catches it and tells him to stop before like his body has caught up. So there's a lot of that of just like really hammering that connection with the dogs. And then over time layering in the endurance um, and the difficulty to make sure that the dogs are actually ready to search you know, dozens of acres at a time, potentially without finding a reward. There's a lot of physical fitness that comes into that as well. So while definitely the dogs get an off day or two every every week, um, there's also a lot of physical conditioning, making sure they're really, really in shape. We trail run, we hike, we do all sorts of things. Lots of, you know, mental stamina for the training, um, for both of us, honestly. Yeah. Um, and then in the field, I will also generally carry a gimme with me or two. So I will have a pocket with some dead bats in it or um, something like that so that I can actually um, put try. Uh, the tricky thing is figuring out how to do this in a way that the dog doesn't pick up on what you're doing. But if we haven't found anything for an hour or so, I'll usually put something out to make sure that he gets a rewardable moment. And, um, and if it, whenever possible, I will actually put that out like the night before, if I know where I'm going to be searching um, so that I don't have to try to be in the field trying to hide something when my dog is searching because he's going to pick up on that pattern and then start watching me instead of searching. And that's not very helpful. I don't want him to be finding the gimmies instead of the actual target out of the environment. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was just about to ask about that because I can imagine that working for that long without finding anything can be really discouraging for the dog. Yeah, so part of what you're also looking for, um, and this is a, almost harder to screen for in some ways when you're looking at prospective dogs and building up um, this in, like I'm thinking about this a lot with my maybe baby puppy, um, is building up a love of the search. So they have to also love the game of hunting and they have to love the game of looking for things. And if you watch videos of Barley, like the whole time he's working, his tail is just going crazy. And part of that is the anticipation of finding things. Um, but part of it is also that he likes the game of looking. Um, and if it's not that he's bummed if it's too easy, but that's a huge part as well. Um, is making sure that the dog doesn't just care about the reward, but also enjoys the whole game. Yeah. So I have to bring up your puppy now, now that you've brought him up because I've seen you guys starting to do your work and it's so mm -hmm. fun to watch you two work together. I mean, he just seems like such a rock star of a puppy. So talk to us He's a little so bit about how you get them started in this. Yeah. So Niffler right now, he's, as I said, about five months old. Um, I got him from a breeder in Idaho. So he's literally like a little farm border collie um, out of Idaho. And um, I basically, I got to help with the temperament tests for the litter. <clears throat> so I went down and basically what we did was um, she went through her whole temperament test, the breeder did with whatever she was looking for. And then I brought out what I was looking for, which was I brought out an impossible to solve food puzzle. Um, where the dogs, the puppies could smell the food coming out of it, but there was, they couldn't solve it. And then I basically gave that to each puppy in turn and saw which puppy measured, which puppies persisted the most with it. And Niffler, um, most of his siblings and litter mates gave up after about 30 seconds of trying with it. Niffler timed out the clock at a minute and a half and he was the only one who didn't, he sw switched up a bunch of different um, techniques where he'd like dig at it for a while and then mouth at it and then look at us for a second and then go back to trying again. Um, so that was how I ended up selecting him. And what the initial training has looked like for the first two months that I've had him or so um, has at this point just been, he's just searching for food. So um, I am not introducing an odor of any sort just yet. I think that'll probably happen in the next couple weeks here. Um, but all we're doing is teaching him that he can use his nose to find food and that that's a great game. So in the beginning, it was just his meals. I would take his kibble and kind of partition it out and put these little piles around our apartment so that he got to sniff those out for his meals um, at least once a day. And now we're actually using fresh pet, um, you know, like the rolls of refrigerated dog food mm -hmm. um, and actually setting up intentional searches where um, he's learning about things like, oh, the odor can be slightly elevated and, oh, you can find things in the wind and, 
you know, here's what it might smell like if it's coming from under something or over something. And, you know, using the placement of where I put, um, put his food to teach him more things about odor dynamics so that he gets better and better at finding things. Um, it's really cool to see if I set up the same puzzle for each of my dogs and Barley, you know, he's seven years old. He's been doing scent work for probably four years now, um, three years as a professional, how much faster Barley is at being able to like read these puzzles and understand immediately where, where the odor is coming from and how to follow that versus you can see Niffler really having to do a lot of trial and error and just working his little butt off. Um, yeah. But he's, he's a good sport about it. Um, and he, he really loves the game. So it's, it's been cool to watch. Yeah, I know we've got quite a few people watching. Just to let you guys know, we are taking questions. So if you guys have questions about the process um, of training or working, please feel free to drop those in the comments and I'll be sure to get them to Kayla before we wrap up here. Um, so while we are talking puppies and talking, you know, starting the training process, mm -hmm. are you generally starting with, you said food, are you gen generally starting just in boxes? Do you start to mix it up and put it in the environment pretty quickly? What, what does that look like for you? I started putting it in the environment really quickly. Um, I think Niffler, and I actually, I'm, I'm really pleased about this, and this is a little teaser. I've filmed almost every single scent work training session that Niffler has had throughout his whole life, and I'm ultimately going to be putting that together into a course. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, <laughs> it's going to take a while. But um, I think we probably did two weeks of things being in boxes, um, and that was kind of starting to teach him the cue to search that, um, how to search a larger area. I kind of wanted him to be able to search about half of my apartment with boxes before I started moving things out of boxes. My apartment's about 300 square feet, just for reference. So it's about the size of a, a normal large room. Um, and then I started putting things outside of the boxes, but right next to the boxes. Um, and then pretty quickly, um, got him out of boxes um, and because I really want him to be able to search environments and learn um, without those cues. I think I think that people over rely on boxes and scent work um, or overuse them. I have not found them as necessary or helpful as I think um, sometimes they're they're brought out to be and I, I actually really prefer my dogs to understand that odor could be anywhere. Um, and that the hide could be anywhere right away. Um, so, and, and they do definitely have their place as well. Um, Barley and I, prior to leaving the organiza organization I used to be at, um, had to do a bunch of work with a scent wheel because that was how we were doing, we were doing some actual studies that required that we were using a scent wheel. So that actually required a lot of going back to the basics with him and like reteaching him how to do a lineup. So it, it goes both ways, but yeah, we didn't do a whole lot with boxes. Um, after the first week or two. Yeah, and I know that he's only five months, still very young, but he's already <laughs> working outside finding odor as well. Um, yep. When do you start practicing in novel environments with him? Again, probably about two weeks in, I was starting to do searches with him in our training facility, um, on my front porch. Um, and in a variety of places. Um, so now he's stayed in hotels a couple times as well. So every time we go to a hotel, I try to do a search or two in a different room. Um, and yeah, he's now searching outdoors in um, really, really windy environments really, really well. Um, I mean, I think we're, we're in Southern California right now and we've been getting probably 40 mile an hour winds most days. And he's been able to search out in that really, really nicely. I've been really, really proud of him. Um, That's crazy. I That's think, really impressive. <laughs> yeah. Again, I think when the motivation is high enough and Fresh Pet is really stinky and, and you go about it systematically, like they know how to do this in a lot of ways. Um, I think as long as you're making sure that the game stays fun. Yep. They, they, yeah, they're better and at this than I think, I think they are. Yeah. When do you start introducing other scents with him? So you mentioned you're going to do that soon. Is there a strategic way that you, you know, is there always one that you introduce first? Do you introduce mm -hmm. several at once? How do you go about doing that? 
We'll do one at a time. And what I'm actually planning on is actually introducing him to uh, birch oil, which is what you use for competitive uh, nose work first. Mm -hmm. um, and that's simply because until I know for sure that he can work on a project or is likely to work on a project, I don't necessarily want to introduce that scent to him. Um, because for example, if I train both of my dogs to find dead bats and then two years from now, I get um, someone reaching out saying, hey, we really want you to find dead lizards for some reason. Um, I then have to think about whether or not either of my dog is actually well suited for that project because they are trained on something that is similar, mm -hmm. um, but not acceptable. Um, and it varies a little bit from project to project as far as whether or not that's a problem. So for example, in theory, um, if my dog was trained to find red fox scat and owl pellets that were both, they were a species that overlapped or something like that. In theory, that wouldn't necessarily be a deal breaker because as a handler, when I'm out in the forest, I can tell the difference between an owl pellet and fox scat and I can just reward my dog accordingly and move on, maybe reward him for both just because he's technically correct, maybe not. Um, but so anyway, that's a long winded way of saying I'm probably not going to introduce him to an actual target scent um, until I'm pretty sure he's going to get to work on that project just because we can only at some point you start having the dog know so many things that adding a new project can be challenging because the dog might already know something else that incur occurs in that environment. And depending on the situation, that can be problematic. It's not always, but it can be. Yeah, that's really interesting because, of course, if you've trained to a certain odor, you want to reinforce them for finding it. Um, mm -hmm. How do you make that decision out in the field if there is a challenge where you're in an environment where there could be more than one thing that they've been trained to alert on? Are you always reinforcing or when do you make that decision to not reinforce and ask them to keep going? I generally am going to reinforce as long as I can confirm the dog is correct. Um, so that gets a little tricky too, because sometimes with scat, for example, it's really hard to tell the difference between red fox and bobcat scat. Um, so if I'm supposed to be looking for bobcat and I'm just not quite sure whether it's red fox or bobcat, a lot of times I can't reinforce in those situations just because it's so easy to accidentally train the dog um, onto a new scent. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of what's great about dogs is that they are easy to retrain and add new things too, but it also can be really challenging. Um, so yeah, it, it varies a little bit, but generally, as long as I can confirm that the dog is correct, I will continue rewarding them unless I'm making a conscious decision. And I haven't done this yet, but I know other people who have made a conscious decision to extinguish one of their targets of just like, and this dog is no longer ever going to need to find a moose again. So now every time he finds moose scat, we are not going to reward him for it. Um, and that's not something I've had to do yet, but I know has been done. Yeah, I imagine that's frustrating for the dogs, too, because as you extinguish behaviors, you get a lot of frustration from them. Um, is that is dealing with frustration? You know, do you notice that your dog gets frustrated when out in the field and what kinds of things are they getting frustrated over? Yeah, they definitely can. Um, they can get frustrated, discouraged, um, and especially because we're working in such high distraction environments. A lot of times that frustration just comes out as the dog going off to chase critters instead of searching because the dog has decided that this isn't worth doing anymore. That tends to happen when we're not able to reinforce them. I would say that actually it happens more when we're not able to reinforce them in the field because we can't confirm if they're right than it does just because they're not finding anything. I think that experience of them thinking that they've found something and then not being able to be rewarded is worse for most of the dogs that I've worked with than the experience of not finding anything at all. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I imagine going out yeah. in this, you know, of course, as a dog trainer, you're teaching all kinds of manners and life skills, but are there certain ones in particular that are more helpful in this line of work? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of safety things that I think about a lot in this line of work. Um, I really emphasize directionals. So having the dog be able to go forward, right or left. Um, and that is just kind of a practical and helpful thing. You know, I can direct them to go check up a hill to my right without me having to climb up that hill. Um, so that's great. Um, and then some of the other safety things, we teach a cue of too far. 
which just means, you know, you don't have to come all the way back to me, but, you know, kind of veer back, quit, quit going, you know, 120 miles an hour out ahead of me. That's not going to work right now. Um, I also teach an emergency down. So having the dog stop where it is and lie down, um, which can be really great if, you know, all of a sudden we've got a horse on the trail and I don't want to call the dog to me and make the dog run past a horse. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also don't want the dog to go anywhere or do anything. So we work on a lot of those sorts of, I think they're very similar to most trail manners that you would teach your dog. Um, they're just uh, really, really important for us and what we do as well. Yeah. Have you ever come across anything dangerous out on the trail or out when you guys are, are working? Yeah. Um, we've run into a couple snakes, um, which is always exciting and never great. Um, so far, no rattlers and no bites. Um, but I've used that emergency down several times um, with snakes. Um, we also definitely just spend a lot of time working around prey animals, um, things like prairie dogs and squirrels. all that worthwhile chasing um but things like pronghorn antelope can be really challenging for him um pronghorn can be really curious and i've had multiple situations where they kind of follow you around and they make this really weird honking noise um <laughs> and the thing with the pronghorn that freaks me out and barley definitely gets really excited about them he's a border collie and you know pronghorns and goats they kind of look similar and they move yeah. in herds like they just really turn on that border collie brain um the thing that freaks me out is if he were to take off after them, they'd never go down a, hell, a hole. Like, and they're the fastest land mammals in North America. Um, so luckily we do a ton of work on leavets and I always carry a long line with me. So if I have to, I can just clip him on leash and we can work on leash for a while. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you're kind of always scanning the environment for things that could either, you know, holes you can fall in, <laughs> snakes you could step on, pronghorn that are com going to come and just tease your yeah. dog. <laughs> like, there's just always something new happening. Yeah, that's, that's wild. I'm going to scroll through here and start answering some of these or get some of these questions yeah. answered for people. So again, as you guys are watching, feel, feel free to post mm -hmm. them up. Um, let's see here. We have some people joining us that, um, Bob, his dog is a fisheries detection dog. That's pretty cool. Cool. So protection service in Ireland where she finds hidden fish, hidden nets, and hidden poachers. That's cool. cool. That's so yeah. awesome. Um, Tara's wondering where you're located. I'm based out of Missoula, Montana. Out, out with all the wildlife. Yeah, yeah, all, all the critters, but, <laughs> all the time. But you do you you travel quite a bit though, because you just mentioned you're in California right now. Yeah, yeah, we're in Southern California right now. Um, I'll be working in either Illinois or Nebraska this summer. Um, next year we'll be somewhere in the southeastern U.S., uh, either Tennessee or one of the Carolinas. So yeah, we're all over the nice, place. All nice the time. and close to us. We'll have to get together. <laughs> yeah. Um, Christy says, as a scent work trainer, so enjoying this presentation, it sure hits home that my pups and I are playing in the, in the bush leagues <laughs> compared to, uh, conservation teams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. <laughs> Lots of people are very interested in this. They've never heard of dogs being used for this. Uh, Kit is wondering what your thoughts are about using a rescue dog for this work as opposed to a purebred or purpose-bred dog. Yeah, so Barley, my my older dog, is a rescue. Um, so I got him from a shelter in Denver. He was given up. Um, his owners were basically going through a really rough time, and he is incredibly high energy, incredibly high drive. Um, and I actually spent the first year or two of having him before I got into the conservation dog work like kind of sitting on my kitchen floor, staring at him, wondering what the heck I was gonna do with him because I thought I wanted a high energy dog, but didn't realize how high energy dogs could be. Um, and now that I'm in this line of work, I totally appreciate that. But um, yeah, so there are a couple different organizations around the country that exclusively work with rescue dogs for conservation dog work. So rogue detection teams and working dogs for conservation come to mind. They really only have dogs that are rescues. Um, Niffler is from a breeder. Um, I had planned on getting my second dog from a shelter as well. I really like the idea of kind of being able to 
save two birds with one dog or uh, you know i don't want to use the kill birds metaphor here <laughs> yeah that's not a good um, one <laughs> yeah and basically what i ran into is um it is such a hyper specific thing that i'm looking for that i had a really hard time finding a dog in a shelter um that suited my needs partially because i'm also really really partial to border collies um and I have really, really high demands as far as the dog's stability and environmental, uh, environmental stability, friendliness, temperament. I was able to find a couple dogs that I thought were really good prospects. And then for various reasons, those adoptions didn't go through. Um, generally because I was looking at dogs, I was looking at a dog in St. Louis that I was in love with. And they were like, why the heck do you want to drive to St. Louis from Montana for this dog? And I was like, trust me, I have a really long list and this dog checks it. <laughs> and they, yeah. you know, they just thought I was crazy. Um, I hope that my third dog will also be a rescue, although we'll just have to see. I think um, it is challenging, and I'm sorry, I'm going a little long on this, but it's something I think about a lot. I think as our sheltering population in the US changes because of you know increased availability of community sheltering and helping people um, get the resources that they need and keeping pets in homes, it does mean that more and more of the dogs that appear in shelters in this country are challenging or have challenges. Um, and I think that does make this a little bit harder. Um, I think, you know, there's the blessing that I am looking for dogs that are kind of traditionally considered challenging. Mm -hmm. But I also live in a very, very small apartment um, with multiple dogs. Um, and I'm actually moving into a sprinter van for my field season. So I really need a dog who can handle people and dogs and cars and do the work and is healthy. And, you know, it's, it's a really strong lifestyle for um, a lot of dogs and there are a lot of dogs that could do this work but can't handle the lifestyle um, in shelters and that's a challenge um, yeah that hopefully one day I'll have a facility to deal with dogs that that couldn't deal with living in a sprinter van with two other dogs yeah yeah no that makes total sense you know unfortunately not all but some dogs that come through rescues do come with some baggage and and that's a consideration you have to make because even though you would be a fantastic home for that dog that dog might not be right for the job. And, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately that's the most important thing when you're looking to bring a dog in for, you know, a specific line of work. Yeah, I unfortunately just don't have room to have five dogs um, and experiment with them. But again, yeah, Barley is a rescue and he's been absolutely perfect. So I hope that I'll be able to find more Barleys and shelters in the future and continue building out um, our organization with primarily shelter dogs. That's awesome. So Anne asks, could you expand a little bit more on the conditioning aspect, trail running, hiking, et cetera? So what you do for both yourself and for your dogs to get them physically fit? Definitely. Um, so I think it helps that I'm really active. Um, but I would say that my dogs and I, well, and not Niffler necessarily because he's five months old. So he gets a lot less of the conditioning because of his plates. Um, but we are doing an off-leash hiker walk that's 30 minutes to an hour pretty much every day. And that's even kind of on our rest days. That's our, our baseline. Um, and then I am an avid trail runner. So a lot of days I'm trail running um, or hiking four to eight miles. The dogs come with me most of for most of those. Um, at the end of most of our runs, we will do um, a little bit of a stretching routine. So I've got treats and I'll help the dog touch his nose to his hip, touch his nose to his other hip, um, stretch out his shoulders and his hips, um, you know, just kind of pulling each limb forward and then compressing it back in. We check his toes every time. Um, and then they earn their meals um, through training a lot of the time. And a lot of our training also kind of counts as strength and conditioning. So we might do some sit down stand repetitions, which builds core strength. Um, I might have um, them put their front paws up on something and kind of stretch, which will strengthen their lower back and hips. Um, I don't have a really formal program. We don't own any fitness equipment. Um, most of it is just that we live a really active lifestyle. And the nice thing is, unlike a patrol dog or an apprehension dog, my dogs don't need to be able to climb a 10 foot wall um, or sprint after someone and take them down. So most of the basic like hiking and trail running that's off leash for the dogs where they're moving their bodies through the wilderness, that is what they need to be able to do. So it's relatively easy, in my opinion, to condition these active dogs to do this sort of thing comfortably. Yeah. 
Uh, we've got a great question here from uh, Miha. I have a one-year-old Basset Hound and I would like to use her to find bark beetles. And I'm wondering if the breed is too lazy or not energetic enough to work all day. I have not worked much with hounds. So I'm gonna preface it there. Um, I think for something like bark beetles, generally what you're going to be doing is searching wood piles. So I think it would actually be a relatively easy thing to be able to set up gimmies and short fun repetitions that most dogs would be able to enjoy. You're not necessarily going to be searching a large area in most cases, I don't know for sure. If you're thinking about going out and searching a forest to check live trees, that might be harder. The first thing I'm thinking of with Bassets and a lot of other hounds is that they do tend to be really tracking oriented and a little bit less detection oriented. So that might just not be something she's as excited about. Um, but I certainly think that if you set up your training intelligently with plenty of breaks and make sure it's fun and with lots of wins, bark beetles are actually a probably relatively easy place to break in for a dog that might not be willing to search for five hours over miles and miles of terrain to not find anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got a question here from Madavi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, from a biologist and dog enthusiast perspective, totally enjoying this. How would you train a dog to find window killed birds? Would they need to be trained on fresh specimen? Not necessarily. Um, you know, one of the things that Dr. Nathan Hall says this a lot, and he's one of our, our big scent research guys, is you do want to train the dog for what you want to find, <laughs> which sounds obvious, but, you know, is also important. You know, if, if you want your dog to be able to find really, really fresh birds, you probably need to train with really, really fresh carcasses at some point. If you want your dog to be able to find, you know, mummified birds from last summer, you also need to probably be training them with that. We will see some dogs kind of able to spontaneously generalize to a variety of different um, target scents, but it's probably better to plan on training them with a variety so that they know that they're looking for a variety. Um, my bat specimens are pretty old. They're kind of desiccated and they live in my freezer. And that's just what we've got. As soon as we're out there um, and we're able to start finding fresher things. Um, we're going to start rewarding more heavily for for um, the nice variety there. My fridge, um, my freezer right now has, I think, three different species of bats as well. So that's something you need to think about. You know, if the only sample you have is you've got five samples of dead chickadees, keep in mind you might accidentally be treating your dog to just find chickadees. And if you want, want them to also find juncos, you probably need to get your hand on, hands on a couple juncos. Yep, that makes sense. Um, here's a nice question. What are some of the uh, biggest challenges or most common challenges for new new teams? Yeah, um, I think for me, what was most challenging was really starting to wrap my head around odor dynamics and thinking through based on the behavior that I'm seeing from my dog, how can I problem solve a given area? So if I'm seeing my dog spending a ton of time circling around the bottom of a hill you know can i use my big primate brain to say oh i wonder if the scent is flowing down that hill and i need to help my dog search up the hill to find the target um and that felt really daunting and intimidating to me at first um a lot of our other handlers um that i've seen they might really love dogs um but aren't super well cut out for the day-to-day -day kind of like drudgery and hard physical work of this job you know it kind of sounds it sounds really fun um and it is really fun at times you know like oh my gosh you're going for a walk with your dog and your dog is searching and you're finding things you're doing biology but it also can be really terrible hard work um it can be just like dusty walking through cow patty fields for for hours and hours and hours just getting sunburnt and windburnt and your dog's not finding anything and then <clears throat> i know i also struggled with um when my dog would alert to something and i couldn't confirm it not rewarding him but knowing how important it is not to accidentally train him to find something um it, yeah it, it it can be a really challenging field in a lot of ways and it, i think it's more monotonous and more physically challenging than um, 
than people give it credit for. And there are still times yeah. where I, I'm out there in the field just being like, wow, this is not as sexy as I make it look on Instagram. <laughs> oh, Instagram. <laughs> Giving us a, a very different look at life. I can imagine, though, that that's physically exhausting and mentally exhausting to be out there all day just in the elements working with your dog. And, mm -hmm. and then yeah. generally, you know, generally you've got more than one dog. So you spend all day out in the field with one dog and then you come home and you've got to exercise the others and you've got to train yeah. the others and you've got to process the samples and you've got to email your partners and then you're eating dinner and feeding the dogs dinner and washing the dog and pulling cactus spines out of them. And then, oh my gosh, you have to go out and set out your hides for tomorrow so that your dog has a couple gimmies yeah. um, for your search tomorrow. So it can easily turn into like 16 hour days when you're actually out in the field. And luckily you're not in the field all the time. Yeah. Um, you're, you know, I, quite a bit of back and forth between home and field, but it's also challenging when, you know, if you've got a significant other or a family, it's a lot of time away. Um, yeah. and that can be really, really challenging for, for a lot of people. Yeah, I bet. Um, great question here from Whitney. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between tracking and det detection? Sure. So I've never trained tracking. So um, if we've got any tracking instructors or enthusiasts in the uh, in the chat section, please feel free to chime in and correct me. But so basically the idea of tracking is that your dog is actually following a specific trail of odor to where um, something is. And they, so it's the idea, you know, you see this a lot in movies where, you know, the dog gets to sniff the hairbrush and then takes off with his nose to the ground and follows the track of where the lost child went. They found the child in the woods. And the idea is the dog is actually faithfully following the path that the person or in some cases animal went because they're following that trail. Verse, so you can think of that like hiking on a hiking trail versus detection is more um, the dog actually has something in mind that they're looking for. They're not usually matching something. So I, I would never like give my dog a hairbrush and then tell him to go find someone. But they are going out and they're searching the area until they catch that odor. And then they're actually doing more of what's called air scenting, which is that scent molecules are up in the air, moving around and the dog is following that odor gradient back towards where it is. And so what you can have then is if your, your lost child went like this and then is now on top of this hill, the tracking dog would follow like this up to the top of the hill. The detection dog could start from over here, pretend, oh, there we go, get my hand on screen, could potentially start over here and catch the odor and follow up to here. So one's not necessarily better or worse than the other. Although, um, so for example, in a disaster situation, you wouldn't necessarily want a tracking dog because you're not tracking that person. You're just trying to search the rubble for any person at all. Um, so it varies a lot in both kind of how you implement it and what the dog is doing um, and whether the dog is actually trying to find that odor and then and search back, source back through the odor column. And I'm sorry, this probably is more technical than I want it to be, or actually following that trail. Yeah, no, that makes, I hope that that makes sense. It did, it makes sense, it made sense. <laughs> um, Vanessa asks, are there any kind of tests or certifications for conservation work? <sighs> kind of, not really. Um, so yeah, there's not really like a conservation detection dog guild or something the way that there is like the international association of animal behavior consultants um there is the american society of canine trainers um and i actually just got word that i've been accepted into that okay. um <clears throat> thank you um so they are that is a professional organization um and they do do a some fairly rigorous testing i actually found out that I emailed to schedule my exam and they said that I was being grandfathered in because of the people that have trained me and worked with me and they were able to just sign off. Um, but they're not super well known. Um, there are intermittent certifications here and there. So when Barley and I, two summers ago, we were doing um, uh, zebra mussel detection work in Yellowstone National Park. Um, and there we actually had had to pass an exam with a state watercraft person, I don't remember their specific title, where we had to search a marina um, and actually accurately find the zebra mussels um, on the boats in the marina. Um, and we didn't know where they were, or I didn't know where they were. 
So there are sometimes specific tests like that where you're actually um, expected to go through um, and prove that you and your dog actually know what you're doing, which I think is really good. And I think ought to be used more in this field. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever I am starting a new project from here on out, I am really pushing the people that are hiring me to let me do double blind testing to confirm that the dog and I are actually up to snuff before we deploy. And I just, I want to put us through that and then hopefully over time, the rest of the industry can continue following and make sure that we're not just, you know, accidentally curing our dogs into being correct when we're showing our stuff to our partners. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Any recommendations, Monica asks, on how to get into this field as a professional trainer? I was waiting for this question. Um, Yes. Um, so the biggest thing is to start out um, getting as many skills as you can in wildlife biology field work and detection training, scent work training as you can, if you already have both of those things. So if you're already a field biologist or you already know how to do point counts and camera traps and electroshocking and all of these different things, and you already you know are trialing an NACSW, Great, then it's probably time to start looking at partnering with organizations, um, reaching out to people. Um, you can certainly email me. Um, you can find my contact information on my website, and I'd be happy to give you some more specific pointers. But I think most people, if you're not, if you're not already at the point where you're like comfortable with a GPS and um, walking transects and doing point counts, and your dog knows or you know how to train a dog to do this sort of work, even if your dog is, you know, you've currently got an eight-year-old French bulldog. Obviously, they're not going to be your detection dog going forward. Um, that's okay. Um, but knowing how to do all of those things, once you've got those two skills under your belt, then it's probably time to start looking at partnering with more organizations. You can also just get involved. So um, volunteering with your local, like, weed control organization or something like that, and getting yourself on the ground embedded in your community. And over time, there will be opportunities where you could step up and say, hey, we're having a really hard time with all of our volunteer weed crews missing the baby seedling plants because they're this tall and it's really hard for people to see them. What if I tried training my dog to help find those? And potentially offering yourself up as a volunteer at first um, and then starting to charge from there. Uh, the organizations that you could get hired with to do this sort of work are all quite small and all hire relatively infrequently. So I think going about it more of the side door is going to be beneficial. Um, I think ultimately canine conservationists is likely to be offering some sort of mentorship or like professional guild sort of setup. We don't have that um, set up yet, but I do think that's one of the things that is lacking is that there's not a good way to get like a mentorship and get into this field right now. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about your company. You, I've got your website listed here so people can go check you out. And you're also on Instagram, correct? Yes. And TikTok. And TikTok. So talk to, us, talk to us a little videos. bit about um, you know, what your goals are, what kind of things people can expect you know, learning-wise from you moving forward. Yeah. So as I said, I think the biggest thing that I know is likely to happen in 2021 is putting out that um, introductory scent course. It is going to be following the scent work that I've done with Niffler. Um, so it will be puppy appropriate, but also would be just fine for any green adult dog as well. Um, that is something that I'm really hoping to get out in 2021. I am also actively looking for people to join and partner with um, canine conservationists, whether, um, so it's actually a nonprofit. So whether you're interested in helping with as a volunteer or a board member or fundraiser or partner, or you need mentoring or any of those sorts of things, I'm really like in this stage of like actively looking for people to work with. And I do think ultimately, I, I really want to be able to offer more of a formal mentoring program and I want to figure out how to keep that low cost. I don't want it to be something where it's like, yeah, yeah, you can pay 30 grand and then follow me around for a year. Um, because I know I could never have afforded that. That's more than I made in a year when I first was getting into this field. Um, and then also potentially building a little bit of a, a guild where it is possible for people who 
you know, a variety of people who, you know, maybe you're a school teacher during the year or a college professor during the year and you've got a dog and you want to do this occasionally on the summers. And, you know, because I occasionally get, I, I get inquiries from organizations that want three dog teams. Um, and I don't have, I'm one person and I have two dogs. Um, I also, one of the things I'm always thinking about is that right now Niffler is not ready to deploy. Um, he's my puppy. Um, and if Barley tears a toenail in the middle of the field season this coming year, you know, it could even be something that minor. Um, I, I really, ultimately, this organization is going to need to be bigger and it's going to need more hands on deck. So all of that is to say, if it's something you're genuinely really interested in, um, just email me with what is on your mind and there's a good chance I'm going to be open to whatever sort of collaboration or assistance or whatever you're, you're trying to connect with. Super cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. This, I am fascinated by this. I've learned so much today. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Of is, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to share with us? Um, yeah, there's a couple of things. I think a lot of times I get questions about what the dog's lives are actually like when they're not working. Um, and I know that's something I always like to bring up just to make sure that people kind of understand what the life is like for our working dogs. Um, so everything that I do is based within the framework of the humane hierarchy of dog training. So that means that the fir first things first is making sure that the dogs are happy and healthy and well cared for. Both of my dogs sleep in my bed with me. Um, you know, they're they're part of the family. And one of the things that I am always trying to make sure of as we're thinking about canine conservationists growing is that I never want to end up in a situation where I have so many dogs that I'm having to create and rotate for different groups of dogs. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that in a lot of working dog circles, but I personally would really like to avoid that. Um, so I always just kind of like to get that out there that, yeah, we, we do really focus on making sure that their lives are as good as possible. And if at any point work, for the dogs is detracting from the dog's life instead of adding to it, that would be something that I would I would consider retiring the dog for that. You know, it, I don't want this to just be something that the dog can do. I want it to be something that the dog loves to do and wants to do. Um, and if you if you do bother to follow us on Instagram or TikTok, you will see how much <laughs> both of them love the work and are dying to do the work, um, which is just a lot of fun to see. So I just love sharing that sort of stuff and helping to educate people about all the different aspects of this work. I'm, as you can tell, really passionate about it. Yeah, it shows. It shows that you're passionate about it. And it's it's yeah. so interesting. I mean, again, I not met anyone else that does this. So it's really cool to see how you can apply, you know, the same concepts of scent work training, but in a really cool and impactful way. Yeah, it's really amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. I really appreciate it. For anybody watching that wants to learn more or wants to connect, um, you can reach out to Kayla directly um, from her website. Her email address is up there and we've included the link in this description for you all to make it easy. Um, and I will edit it to add your handle for Instagram so that people can go over and follow you there as well. Thank you so much for joining Great. us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.